So would you please <laughs> tell us the gist of like what the impetus was like for you to write this particular article that you wrote and um, yeah, how that came about. Sure. Well, you know, the, the, the history of uh, the Nazi connection in Ukraine and in Canada is very, very clear. Uh, Ukraine, um, I'm generalizing its history, but it's a divided nation. Uh, uh, roughly half of it was content being part of the Soviet Union. The other half hated the Soviet Union. And so much so that when Germany invaded during World War II, a substantial number of Ukrainians collaborated, uh, volunteered to be in SS units. Uh, you know, when we talk about the, the massacres of Jews and Poles and Eastern Europe, those, uh, a lot of those killings were committed by local people who volunteered. So, and that is still part of, uh, of Ukraine. The Nazi salutes, uh, they've been airbrushing photos, all kinds of Nazi insignia on Ukrainian uniforms, a shopping mall. There's a famous video of a swastika, uh, neon lights in a shopping mall. So, um, but if you bring this up, you're immediately shut, shut down. It's Russian propaganda. It's not true. The president is Jewish. Uh, right. No. no. Um, Canada also played a role because immediately after World War II, when the Cold War began, um, uh, Canada admitted, um, um, Im allowed to immigrate war criminals from Ukraine, from some of the Baltic states. Um, they wanted people who were anti-communist. Uh, the U.S. rules were a little more rigid. It was hard for them to immigrate. So Canada, Britain, the US, they were all in cahoots here in allowing war criminals to come to their country. Uh, Canada has these monuments to these Nazi units. Uh, the current deputy prime minister, her grandfather was a pro-German propaganda, Stepan Bandera, the leader of the collaborators. His grandson lives in Canada. But these were things you weren't supposed to talk about. Now for reasons known only to themselves, uh, Zelensky was visiting, and all they had to do was have Zelensky and Parliament say they loved him, say we'll never give up, we'll defeat Vladimir Putin, yada, yada. That's all they had to do. Instead, someone had the bright idea of finding an actual Nazi to be honored with standing a standing ovation from every member of Canada's Parliament that was present. Um, and I, I think it's a combination of things. I think, um, you know, when you lie a lot, you start to believe the lie. So there's this obvious fact that so they introduced him as a man who fought the Russians in World War II. Any Ukrainian who fought the Russians in World War II was a Nazi, period, the end. But they, someone decided this was a good idea uh, they were gilding the lily. And I think in part that's because Ukraine is losing the war and they don't know what to do. They back themselves into this corner. Uh, there are indications they want to get rid of Zelensky now. He's outlived his usefulness. So I think a combination of all of these things created this political debacle for Canada. Yeah, I mean, and just the hypocrisy of mm -hmm. the whole thing. I've been saying it left and right. You know, anybody you have... And I even saw it in your article, like the, they're tr they're bringing out the blue and yellow flags. And all of a sudden, it's like the, it's as if they forgot exactly what went down in World War Two. We're back to this red scare all over again. And it is it's ridiculous. We are actually support. We're funding the Nazis in Ukraine against the Russians who were last I heard were on our team um, as if there's teams. But like it's it's just it's really I think of it as just a matter of keeping the military industrial complex churning. That's mm -hmm. that's what I think. I mean, it's it's very very like profitable. I, I, I absolutely that's one of the things you know Raytheon and McDonnell Douglas and Grumman and whoever the heck else they're going to get theirs. They always get theirs. Yeah. Uh, also, they want they thought they were going to be able to weaken Russia by instigating this conflict. Uh, that is not going to happen. 
despite all the sanctions, Russia's economy is humming along. They can't boycott Russian oil. Russia is very close to China. It is forming relationships with other countries. So this idea that they can keep encroaching on Russia, that Russia would accept Ukraine becoming a member of NATO is just ridiculous and very, very dangerous. Uh, so this very dubious uh, uh, assertion that they could get what they wanted is being shown to be of complete failure. Um, you know, the U.S. even, and I'm convinced they did it, Seymour Hersh is right, they even blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, the media cover for them, so people haven't heard as, uh, as much about it as they should have. And I think y yesterday or today is the anniversary of the actual sabotage, by the way. Um, but all of these things that are very, very dangerous, and people, and the other thing is political. Americans do not like the fact that Ukraine and the military industrial complex are getting billions of dollars. I didn't watch it, but I heard about the 60 Minutes story, basically revealing at last that the U.S. is supporting Ukraine completely. It's like the 51st state. Uh, the entire government apparatus would fall apart were it not for U.S. money. So people who are here told, no, you can't have the child tax credit. No, you can't have the emergency COVID relief anymore. We're always told no, but it's everything for Ukraine. And they're very nervous as a uh, presidential election year um, approaches. Margaret, can you talk about the, you know, every once in a while, the two parties, but let's be honest, they're just, you know, two wings of the same corporate party in many ways. Um, but every once in a while, the red team and the blue team switch teams or switch players, I should say. And so one of the things that clearly happened as a result of Trump's presidential win is you had this coalition of neocons in the GOP that basically you want to give it to Trump or you want to give it to uh, the more populist side of, of uh, you know, the right that decided that they want no part of the war machine and that they're going to make a stand and make it a part of the fabric of the GOP as it stands today. And we've seen that reflected in the debates. The likes of David Frum, Jennifer Rubin, oh my God. Bill Kristol, oh. they have been welcomed into the Democratic establishment with arms wide open, not mm -hmm. open arms. They've wide swapped sides open. is what you're saying. They've switched. And so I'm wondering if those, if, if the bureaucratic neocon contingent of the Beltway, which has been welcomed into the Democratic Party establishment wide open, that they have played a substantial role in terms of ginning up support for, you know, anti-Russian sentiment, as oh, has been yeah. the case over the past several years. And now it's really coming home to roost because the very class of people in this country, and you live around them all day, every day mm -hmm. in Manhattan and different parts of the United States, where they are very keen to send money and even people off to die, but they, of course, will be the last people that will ever pick up a weapon to defend a nation. Mm -hmm. They seem all too willing to say that the war in Ukraine must continue, even though a half a million Ukrainians on paper have been killed. Mm -hmm. If even a fraction of that were U.S. troops, would they accept such? Uh, I'm not sure what the answer would be, but they seem to be completely okay if another half a million Ukrainians have to be slaughtered. Uh, your thoughts on this titanic shift in many ways in regards to the democratic establishment today, especially when it comes to foreign war. Policy. Yeah, well, you know, I, I wanna mention, you know, some members of Congress have actually used this as a talking point. No Americans have died in Ukraine. Now they don't care that the Ukrainians they came claim to love so much, they don't care if they're thrown into the meat grinder, but this is actually a talking point. Well, no Americans have died, just some, you know, some poor slob from Kiev is the only Lindsay one dying. Graham, Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham, Mitt Romney, some others. Um, so, and you're absolutely right. And this all goes back to, it, it goes back a long way, lest we forget, uh, it was the Obama administration in 2014 where, and Victoria Nuland was part of the Obama administration. Hey. Now she's back. Um, now she's back. Uh, <laughs> and they sided with the help to the right wing to depose the elected president of Ukraine. So that goes back to Obama. 
Um, then you have the 2016 presidential election where Hillary Clinton, uh, who should have been spending her energy on a get out the vote effort, instead spent months um, trying to tie Donald Trump to Russia, uh, in part to deflect attention from her own deal, or rather Bill Clinton's dealings with the Russians, the U U uh, uranium deal, which is absolutely true. It's a well-sourced so story. Um, but she was afraid of people tying her to Russia, so she decides to tie Donald Trump to Russia, and she called him Putin's puppet, and it'll be Christmas in the Kremlin if he wins. And then, of course, she loses. And in order to both um, excuse her loss, uh, it continues. And Democrats, of course, they continue. And so now lib people who are liberal about everything else are hawkish about Ukraine and about some other issues. Um, then there are some, it's very odd. So the one member of Congress most outspoken about ending funding for to Ukraine is Marjorie Taylor Greene. And um, I, I, I've looked at some of her statements about Ukraine and I know I, I can't praise her. And, and, at, and also a lot of people on the right they're against funding Ukraine because they want to make a war against China. So their argument is, oh, let's go, no, leave Russia alone. Let's go to war against China. So it's some wackadoodle thing in, in the end. But people on the left, they should be allegedly on the left, should be embarrassed. They have not been able to come up with any coherent argument. They are afraid of their leadership. Either they agree with them outright, and if they don't agree, they have um, been beaten down. They had that, I don't know if you recall last year, they um, uh, wrote a letter. It was a weird fence straddling, you know, announced themselves. Yeah. So the only people speaking against Ukraine are on the right, but they're people you can't trust for other reasons. And the progressives, the people who used to speak up even occasionally, there were always a handful of people. There aren't any more. And that's where we are right now. Yeah. I mean, even Barbara Lee didn't sign on to the, the war in Iraq. And she always, like, kind of, not brags about it, but kind of. Like, she plays that card. Yeah. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.